We are going to start a new series. And part of the problem with starting this new series is it's in the book of Daniel, and a lot of you will have thought, well, I remembered that in Sunday school when I was in uh, nursery school or elementary school. We tend to teach some of the narrative stories. And if you'll notice, I always use, try to use narratives rather than stories, because oftentimes when you think of story, that is once upon a time. And the scriptures don't tell us about stories. It tells us about true events. And Daniel, and the book of Daniel, I believe, is a particularly important book for us to look at in today's world and context. And it's interesting. A book that was written some 2,600 years ago applies today and will assist us in our daily lives, will assist us in our understanding, because all too often, you know, uh, in today's world, if we don't know where we are, don't know where we're going, we plug in our coordinates in a GPS and try to figure it out. Well, God has given us, if you will, a map, a GPS. It's called the Scriptures. And it tells us how to journey this life. And the book of Daniel has a number of themes, and we'll touch on most of them, but the emphasis on in this study that we're in is threefold. The first is that we are strangers, aliens living in a foreign land. The second is that God is sovereign. God is, as we say, is in control, but he's not just in control, he's in charge. It is God who determines the outcomes. God is intimately in, in aware and in control and sovereign over nations. And the book of Daniel discusses that, but he also discusses that God is involved in the affairs of individuals. Just as important as the nations, God is also a God who is intimately involved with and aware and takes actions in the lives of individuals. And then the other aspect is prayer. How the people of God pray and the consequences of that. In this beginning of Daniel, I'm going to spend, if you will, two weeks and a sum in the introduction. So part of the day is introduction, Part of next week time will be introduction, and part of next week will be introduction, because it's that important to kind of get the whole context of what's going on. And so, for the next three weeks, we're going to take a look at the first four verses, and then in the third week, we'll go a little further. So Daniel chapter 1, starting with verse 1, says this, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Use in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And so right off the bat, what we are told is, in essence, Daniel, among the, the best and the brightest of Jerusalem, are placed in exile and sent to serve the king Nebuchadnezzar, a foreign king, no longer would they be home. And Daniel and others are youths having to live in a foreign land. They will be aliens and then required, if you will, to serve the king of an alien nation. Now you say, well, how does that relate to me? Well, guess what, folks? We are aliens and strangers in a foreign land. You may have been born in this country, 
but it ain't yours if you're a believer. So what I want to do is I'm going to share a number of scriptures that shows where our citizenship is, where are the fact is that we are living in a foreign land. And the reason why I'm using so many scriptures is that I won't, don't, well, if I use one or two, you say, well, you can take anything out of context, but I'm going to use a number of scriptures to show us that just as Daniel was living in a foreign land, even though we may have been born here, or have come here on our own, or come here because somebody required us to be here, or brought us here, that we are still foreigners and aliens. And I'm going to start with the words of Jesus. Where better to start? So in John chapter 15, start with verse 18, he says this, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you keep my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who has sent me. So Jesus says to his disciples and to us, we may be in the world, but we are not of the world. This is not our home. This is not our place of abode. This is simply where we are to serve him until he calls us home. But this is not our home. And the, the sad thing is, Christian believer, atheist, and everybody in between seems to spend more time developing here than where we are going to be. So we spend more time reading books about how to acquire wealth here. We spend more time about how to, how to win friends and influence people here. Thinking that all the good that we do here somehow will benefit us and that this will make it better for us. And Jesus is saying, this is at home. You may be in it, but you are not of it. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 8 through 10, and then skipping to 13 through 16, talking about Abraham and others. And it says this, by faith, notice, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, most of us, when we read the story of Abraham, we think about, okay, God made him a promise. He goes and, and he heads out and he lands up in this property. And God says, I'm going to give it all to you. Abraham went there by faith. He didn't know where the destination was. He didn't know all that God had, was going to give to him or bless him. But he went because he believed God. But notice that what Abraham was looking to was not just the raw land. He understand that this land God was going to build and that God was the architect, the designer of this place and that he was going to have this builder is God. He understood even though God had promised him that land, that he hadn't seen it yet, but he was going to wander there even though it was his as an alien person. And then 13 to emphasize says this, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, 
But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country which, for which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The act of faith wasn't just simply the going, but the staying. And even though the circumstance may not appear, well, when, God, are you going to give this? And as a matter of fact, Abraham died before he saw it. But he saw it. And others who God makes promises to understand that it's not the here and now that they're looking for, but that God is building a beautiful city called the New Jerusalem. And we are awaiting for that. And we may die before that happens. But by faith we say, I would rather wait for it than to dwell as a citizen here. They confess that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They confess, just as Jesus has said, I'm in the world, but I am not of the world. And all too often, we just kind of live life not understanding that we are just passing through. We are soldiers. We are travelers in a land that's not ours, not given to us. Ephesians tells us this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Paul is saying that even though this is not our home, and even though we are aliens and foreigners in a strange land, we are expatriates, if you will. All you have to do is see some of these travel shows where people want to move to a, a foreign country. And oftentimes they choose communities where there are expats. And what that means is other citizens, other people who come from the same country so that they feel a little more at home. You know, maybe if you're in Honduras and it's mostly Spanish speaking, and if you have difficulty with Spanish, kind of hang out with people who speak English. You hang in that community. Paul is saying, we're strangers and aliens but we're hanging out together as fellow citizens. We're expats of heaven. And we are built together as that building. And so our fellowship here isn't just one of, but it has purpose. That it encourages, it strengthens each of us. Philippians further says, For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Now to be a citizen of this country, two things have got to ha one of two things have to happen. You either have to be born here, or born of parents who are citizens, or if you're born in a different country and you want to come here, you have to go through and pass a citizenship test. Well, fortunately, there's no citizenship test for heaven. But you do have to be born there. It's called being born again. And when you are born again, you are made a citizen of heaven. So you are no longer just wandering this world as a stranger and alien permanently but now we have because have been born again 
citizenship in heaven. And that citizenship will transform this body into a body like Christ at the resurrection. And he's able to do it because of the power that he has. Peter, again emphasizes in Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who are chosen. Even Peter, it's not just Paul, not just Jesus. Peter understands that those who live are living as aliens and strangers. It doesn't matter where, the, where you are. It can be in Jerusalem. It can be in Asia. It can be even here in the United States. All of us are aliens who reside in a foreign land. But to make sure that you understand who's in charge, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 tells us this. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Throughout the history of Christianity and the history of of people, they think they make things better, and they think if they just get enough power, they can do things their way, and then the world will be as it ought to be. And others seek to be benevolent dictators and say, I will rule, but I'll make it beneficial for you. It's Jesus' kingdom that is going to come. And it is Jesus' kingdom that he's in charge of. And it is we who are citizens of that, that we are participants of this kingdom. Now, at this point in the history of the world, we don't see his kingdom all that clearly. The book of Daniel will give us a little more insight into that. But just as assuredly as we are citizens of heaven, there will come a time when he will be king of kings and lord of lords, not just in heaven, but here on earth. So in between times, what are we to do? What's our action? Are we to just... uh, Sit in the pews and say, okay, well, it's Jesus' world. He's in charge. He's in control. Uh, I'm just kind of a foreign here, so I'm just going to wait for him to show up, and then everything will be great. The book of Daniel does not teach that, nor does the scriptures. So let's take a look at what we are to do then with understanding that we are resident aliens in a foreign land. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Now this one who warns from heaven is Jesus. The writer of Hebrews is saying, if you think the people who got in trouble for not listening to the prophets, when Jesus speaks and you don't pay attention, Look out. And his voice shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. See, if you will, God's through Jesus, is going to shake things up. And he's going to shake things up so much that only the permanent, only the immortal will survive and all the temporary, all the things that we're so concerned about, all the things that we try to build up, all the things of our own kingdoms 
will be shaken in a greater magnitude of earthquake than man has ever known. And those things which cannot be shaken, his kingdom remains. Verse 28, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, give you a personal aside. When I was a seven-year-old, I wanted to become a lawyer. The reason I wanted to become a lawyer was that I wanted to become the president of the United States. That's a pretty big dream. And I'm currently a lawyer and not going to be the president of the United States. One, I'm not running. Two, I won't get enough votes to win. But I got a different call. And that call was to be a pastor so that I might have an impact permanently. For you see, if I realize my dream of becoming president of the United States, and let's say I won by 98% of the electorate, and then was reelected by 99% of the electorate, and I did all kinds of wonderful things, and everybody wanted to put statues of me because I did such great, wonderful things, and was it a marvelous President Joseph G. Davis was such a wonderful president. After eight years, some other man or woman would come into office, and over a period of a few months or a few years, or maybe even a few decades, change everything I did. There is no permanence. I'll give you an example. How many of you can tell me who the 12th president of the United States was? His name was Zachary Taylor. Anybody know what he did? Well, he also died in office. Anybody know who the successor was? Millard Fillmore. See, it's our history. You don't remember. And I don't know if it's self-justification or God saying, those things don't last. Spend your time putting God's word in people's lives. Strengthen them so when they start to stumble, you or somebody else picks them up so that we in this unshakable kingdom can give praise and glory and honor and power to our Lord. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. Well, we're supposed to be thankful? Yes, Because we are not a part of this messed up world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Doesn't matter if you like the guy who's the president or the next one or the last one or whatever, because we're not of it. It may affect us temporarily, but we're citizens of heaven. And just as I'm concerned of the happenings in other countries, and how people may be hungry or starving or they're whatever. It's there. Kind of like here. Yeah, I'm a citizen of this country. And I'm glad I am. But I am blessed more so to be a citizen of heaven. So therefore, I'm going to show gratitude. By which we may offer to God an acceptable service. So we're not to sit on our derriere, our gluteus gluteus maximus. We're supposed to serve God. How do we serve God? By serving one another and serving the world. By doing good. Serving. That 
is what we're to do while we're waiting, while we are resident aliens, while we're sojourning, while we are foreigners in a strange land. We are to serve. And the book of Daniel shows Daniel and others serving their, that king. They didn't vote for him. That's okay. They served with reverence and awe. You don't serve grudgingly. You don't serve because you're expecting something. You serve because you're serving as if you're serving God in reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. When we read the first few verses of Daniel, and I'm going to come back to this later, the circumstances could indicate that the people who followed God were in big trouble because a foreign king who served a foreign God took the best and the brightest of Jerusalem and some of the temple silverware and vessels and took it and put it in the treasury of his God. He was showing just like if you picture like the Roman times when they would conquer a people, they would take the, the leaders and the kings and they would drag them through the streets of Rome to show that they were superior, that their, their might was such, and that look at the spoils that we're bringing back and we are great. And it may look like the king Nebuchadnezzar and his God took the victory lap. But Daniel tells us his God had nothing to do with it, Nebuchadnezzar. It was God, the God of Daniel, who delivered the people to Nebuchadnezzar. So we are to serve. We are citizens in a foreign land. But you know, God has also given you an office. He's given you a responsibility. And I'm not going to give you this scripture verse. I want you to look it up. There's a couple of places. It says that we are his ambassadors. We're the ambassadors of Christ. Well, what does an ambassador do? That's her person represents the official power and authority of the government that you're an ambassador of. So if you were the ambassador, let's say Italy. I, I like the place. It's one of the few places that I broke my my kind of self, I always want to go, to, there's so many places I've never been to that I always say I don't want to go back because I want to go to different places. Well, I actually went back to Italy. Probably wouldn't mind going back again. But anyway, so let's say I get a telephone call and they say, Joe, we have named you as ambassador to Italy. Which means the following. I would represent the government of the United States. I would seek to do what's in the best interest of the, the interest of the government of the United States. I would also try to live up to the things that, that would be expected of me so that I wouldn't cause any disrepute to the United States. So it probably wouldn't be a good idea to get drunk and carouse and do all the, okay? You're so, there's certain things you're supposed to do as your representative. The other thing if they called me up and said, you're going to be the ambassador to Italy, I probably would decline it because, go oh God. But get, the reason I decline it is I'd have to leave here. You have to move there. It's really tough to be the ambassador of some place and to represent the country if you're not in the country to represent it. So God has called us to be ambassadors, to be the representatives of his to tell the world this kingdom 
about the good news. We are his representatives to bring forth the good news. So not only are we citizens, and not only do we wander around in this foreign land, but we wander around in this foreign land to do service, acceptable service, with reverence and awe, but we have been given a responsibility to be his ambassadors. Now in Daniel, it talks about that he called the be- he took the best and the brightest, the good-looking ones, the smart ones, the ones who, who could learn, the ones who could be of value in the court, which would leave out 95% of us or more, including me. But God has a different standard. He calls the broken, the ugly, those who the world would reject. And God has called us to be his children, to be his representative. Now, if I got a call to be the ambassador of wherever, I'd be pretty pumped. I'd be pretty excited. That'd be a kind of a cool gig. And I'd probably try to figure out how I could fly here on Sundays, figure something out. But it, I, even if I turned it down, I would be stoked. I'd probably, you know what? I got called. They wanted me to be the ambassador of Italy. Then why aren't we stoked and pumped that we are not called? to be the ambassadors of heaven, to be the representative of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, we live in a foreign land. We are strangers and aliens here. We are in it, but not of it. But just as we will see that God is sovereign, of nations. He is sovereign of the individual. And just as he has called Daniel to service, he has called you and me as well. So let us understand this isn't home. Let us understand where home is. And let us understand what we are to do until that day when everything gets shook up and there's a new heaven and a new earth and his kingdom will be evident to all. And all God's people said,